All right, well, it feels like it was eons ago that I was a young, blushing, engaged young woman. <laughs> and as I'm sure many of you who have been engaged can attest, during that period of engagement, I was daydreaming about my wedding. Of course, I was planning my wedding, but I was also daydreaming about all these different moments. What was it going to be like the first time I saw my dad and he saw me in my dress? What was it going to be like to take his arm, lock eyes with my future husband, and walk down the aisle? What was it going to be like to stand there and say our vows to one another, holding each other's hands, promising our lives, our love, our forevers to one another before God and before our family and friends? But there was one moment on my wedding day that I never thought about, that I had not anticipated, but this moment is so starkly emblazed in my memory and it so took me by surprise. And it was the moment that I bent down and my sister, who I'm so sad couldn't be here tonight, my sister placed the veil on my head. And it was after my manicure was done, my dress was on, my hair and makeup were good to go, and that veil getting put on was the very last touch before I got married. And I remember standing up from bending over for her to put that on, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I was overwhelmed because I looked like a bride. There was something missing before the veil got put on. I didn't I knew it was my wedding day, but it didn't click. I'm getting married, I'm the bride today, until I looked at myself with the veil on. And in that moment, I realized I'm the bride. I'm Mike's bride. I'm getting married today. Well, ladies, today we're gonna open God's word and we are going to see some things that he instructs us to put on as his bride. And if we don't do this, if we fail to put these things on, we are not going to look how he wants his bride to look. We are not going to look and reflect the gospel and this amazing grace that he has saved us with. We're not going to reflect it well. So I'd like you to open your Bibles with me and turn to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is part of the pastoral epistles, the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And it's Paul writing to his protege, his son in the faith. He loved Timothy. He talks about Timothy all over his epistles. Timothy is mentioned as being with him and a, a confidant and a partner in ministry throughout the book of Acts. Timothy was uh, very dear and near to Paul, as was the church at Ephesus. Now, Ephesus has been compared to modern-day Orange County. Super wealthy, super elite, have everything that they could possibly want or need, really not lacking for anything, and yet it was this church that Paul deeply loved. And so Paul, at one point, commissioned Timothy to go be the pastor of the church at Ephesus. This person that he dearly loved, that he considered to be his son in the faith, he commissions to go and pastor this super important church. But as we read through the book of 1 Timothy, we see that the church at Ephesus was really facing two big problems that Paul wanted to address with Timothy. The first thing that we see in chapter 1 is distraction. They were dealing with some false teachers, and they had people coming in there and teaching them a gospel, teaching them practices that were contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were being distracted from pure and true theology. Now, the second issue that Paul then goes on to discuss with Timothy in chapter 2 is some sort of disruption that was happening during the worship services. The Ephesians were behaving in a way, both men and women, were behaving in such a way that it was disrupting their time together. So we've got these two issues that Paul is writing to Timothy about, distraction and disruption. Could there be more adequate words to describe 2020? 
distraction and disruption. And albeit, although our problems that we have faced this year are vastly different and not really the same than what they were experiencing at that time, there's obviously still some correlation here and some lessons to be learned. Paul was wanting to correct, get back on track, refocus the men and women of this church and talk about what is the point? What is this all about? What are we aiming for? What are we striving for? How should we be behaving in the household of God? And so all of that happens and we now find ourselves in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 2 through 9. So if you haven't turned there already, please go ahead and turn there now. We are going to see how God wants us to live, behave, focus on as we specifically are women in his church, as his bride. Starting in verse 9, he says, likewise. We're kind of picking up in the middle of his sentence here, uh, which we'll get to, but he says, likewise. Also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Okay, so I said we're hopping into the middle of this sentence. Paul starts, if you look at verse 8, by saying, I desire. And then he talks to the men. Because remember I said there's some, some kind of disruption going on with both the men and the women in the way that they were behaving in church. So he first addresses the men by saying, I desire that in every place. And then he gives the instructions for the men. Now he's saying, likewise. So the likewise is referring to his desire, his instructions, how it is that women should be behaving. So Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's words, God's thoughts on, pa on paper, is telling us that first, women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty. So we're going to hop right in and put point number one down on your outline like this. Put on modesty and humility. As we are living as women in Christ's church, the bride waiting for his return, he wants us to behave and put on modesty and humility. Now you're gonna notice that under point number one, you've got an A and a B. So letter A under point one is in your cl clothing choices. So put on modesty and humility in your clothing choices. That's letter A. Obviously, modesty, we all know what that means. We shouldn't be showing off too much skin. We shouldn't be wearing revealing clothing, whether that's too tight or too short or whatever it may be. We want to be modest. And as anyone who grew up in the church, any good Sunday school grad, what I teach my young daughters is what? Modest is hottest, ladies, right? <laughs> modest is hot. You know this. You guys have heard that before, no? Okay, modest is hottest. We want to be modest with the bodies that God has given us. We want to be careful to not cause any man, let alone our brothers in Christ, to stumble in any way. And so we need to adorn ourselves. We need to put on modest clothing. Here's the thing. He goes on to say, adorn themselves in respectable attire, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. So what's he talking about there? But poor Jessica's like, I've got a braid in my hair, <laughs> which we're going to talk about. <laughs> I looked up and saw her. <laughs> it's okay, because what is the point? The point is, does that mean that we as now 21st century Christians on the other side of the globe should not be wearing braids, should not be wearing jewelry, should be wearing sacks? What does this mean for us? <laughs> what does this mean for us today, right? Yes, he says, maybe that would be comfortable some days. But what does this mean for us today? Well, the point is, like I said, in Ephesus, they were a very affluent, had everything that they could want or need at their fingertips. And the point that's being made here is that the women were dressing in such a way as to A, be provocative in their dress, but B, to put themselves on display to flaunt not only their beauty, but to also flaunt their money. 
So that's really what the issue is. It's the issue of the heart. Does it have to specifically do with if you wear a braid in your hair or if you wear jewelry? I'm not suggesting that we snap Jessica's braid to cut it off right now or that I go pull off my earrings. What matters is the issue of the heart. What is the heart motivation behind when I get dressed in the morning, when you get dressed in the morning, when we're going to church, when we're going out on a date night, whatever it may be, what is the heart motivation behind it? Are we doing it because we're attention seeking either to put the focus on ourselves or, or to put the focus on our wealth? That's what the women at Ephesus were doing. All right, let's look at this word adorn. He says, the likewise, the women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. Now, this word adorn in the Greek, it means to order, to arrange, to set, or to put in order. So commentators across the board agree that when Paul is speaking here about this external adornment, he's actually not just talking about externally how someone puts themselves together. It's actually a much deeper issue like we just talked about. It's an issue of the heart. There was a heart problem going on with the women at Ephesus. They wanted to put themselves on display, which is why point number one is not only to put on modesty, which is super important and practical, but it's and humility. That's the heart issue behind it. So put point or put letter B down on your outline like this in your demeanor. So put on modesty and humility, not only in your clothing choices, but also in your demeanor. A Christian woman's overall demeanor should not be one that seeks attention, that is boastful, or is selfish. We're going to do some rapid fire verses here right now. So grab your Bibles and turn to the book of First Peter. If you were here a while ago, I think this is two, maybe three years ago for Valentine's Day, we looked at First Peter 3, 3 through 4, which is really a parallel passage to, to this passage here in First Timothy. First Peter 3, 3 through 4 says, do not let your adorning be external. There's that word again, adorning. Don't let it be external, the braiding of your hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Again, it's not this overall consuming uh, thought, attention, time being poured into external things, but how are we cultivating the inner person, the person of the heart, with that imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit? Flip a few pages back to 1 Peter 5.5. 5. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Peter says, clothe yourselves, all of you, men, women, children alike, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Again, it's that thought of putting on humility, of taking on, th think of Philippians 2, I'm not going to turn you there, you guys are well-taught compass women, you know it, put on that mindset of Christ who came as a servant, who didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. And we are called to put on that same sort of mindset. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read it for you. Just another aspect of humility is being someone that's not boastful. And because I have, uh, you know, young children in my house, I am very familiar with this verse because for the youngest age possible, kids have no problem boasting at how great they are at stuff. So Proverbs 27, 2 is something that is often repeated in our house. Let another praise you and not your own lips. A stranger, excuse me, not your own mouth. A stranger and not your own lips. And sometimes I'll just look at my kids and I'll go up, oh, Proverbs 27, 2, and they know. I don't want to hear a boastful thing coming out of your mouth that you're the greatest at jumping or you're the greatest at, you know, cartwheels or whatever it may be. From the littlest of ages, they have no problem saying, I'm so good at this. I'm the best. Look at what a great job that I did. As Christian women, that shouldn't be named among us. 
being boastful, being selfish, being self-absorbed, wanting the spotlight on ourselves. So not only in the clothing choices that we choose, but also in our overall demeanor, how are we conducting ourselves, modesty and with humility. You guys know, I think I've shared it with you before, but the C.S. Lewis quote, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And I was, as I was prepping for this message today, I remembered that uh, Lewis quote, and then I remembered this incredible story that I read about the Bush family. You guys know the the Bushes, both President Georges, (laughs) Um, not Washington Bush, Um, but Uh, There's this incredible story that George H.W. Bush's granddaughters share. They actually wrote it in their their book um, that they came out with a few years ago about this incredible time that their grandfather displayed this sort of humility. Now, they didn't call it humility, but I'm going to call it humility. It was the night before uh, George H.W. Bush was going to go out and start his campaign for his presidency. At this point, he was the vice president and, you know, he had been nominated by his party to go out and to to be the presidential nominee. And so he was going to start his campaign. And so the Bush family, if you know anything about them, super tight knit, super close family. And so the night before, he knew that he was going to be gone for an extended period of time. And so he and his wife, Barbara, invited their granddaughters over to their house for a sleepover. He wanted to spend these last few moments with his granddaughters. So he's living in the vice presidential house, mansion, I don't know what it is, but the vice president gets a house too. It's not just the White House. Um, And so he's living in this place and his granddaughters come over and they get ready to spend the night. Well, as any young girl has, Barbara, his his wife and his granddaughter, this is his granddaughter, his granddaughter Barbara had this special stuffed animal. And at some course, at some point throughout the evening, she had lost her special stuffed animal. And so here he is trying to put his grandchildren to bed, just wanting this special time with them. And yet he's got this inconsolable, I don't know, five or six year old, maybe even four year old that can't find her special sleep comfort thing. And so George H.W. Bush with his secret service team goes out himself onto the grounds of the vice president's house and searches with flashlights, combs over the entire estate, looking for this beloved stuffed animal that his granddaughter lost. Again, he did this the night before he was going out to campaign for the presidency. That's a pretty big deal. That's a night that you're probably thinking, I want to get a good night's sleep. I don't want to be out with a flashlight, looking all around for precious fluffy, right? (laughs) But that's what he did. So if we take C.S. Lewis's quote and we impose it on this situation with uh, George H.W. Bush, here's what humility isn't. Humility isn't George H.W. Bush sitting there at the table going, well, you know, I'm I'm not very good at finding things. I mean, Barbara, my wife, always tells me, you know, if it were a snake, it would have bit you because I'm always trying to find things that are right in front of my face. Well, I'm not very, I don't have the best eyesight, so I'm probably not very good. I'm not really the one that should go out and look for stuff. And you know what? While I'm thinking about stuff that I'm not good at, am I really a good politician? I don't know. I'm a VP. Do I really have what it takes to be the president of the United States? Maybe I should just can this whole campaign thing at all. That's not what he did. That's not what humility is. Because do you guys see what the problem with that sort of fake humility, thinking less of yourself? What happens when you're thinking less of yourself? That's the only thing you're thinking about. You're thinking about yourself negatively, but you're thinking about yourself. No, true humility is not considering himself. True humility was saying, whatever it takes, I'm going to go serve my granddaughter. I'm not going to entrust it to someone else, although he had a team and, and, you know, staff and secret service and whoever it was that could have gone out and searched for Fluffy themselves. He was with them. He went out there because someone that he loved had lost something precious and he wanted to bring it back to her. That's humility, not considering himself, putting his sleep, his probably peace of mind, um, 
all of that on the altar of serving someone that he loved. That's humility. That's the kind of humility that Christ calls us to. Thinking not less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. All right. Now, Paul goes on to say really quick in rapid succession here in verse number nine. He instructs uh, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and very quickly and self-control. So put point number two down on your outline like this, pretty straightforward. Put on self-control. Put on self-control. I fear too often in my own life that I too quickly write off self-control because I seem like a put together person. My husband seems to be doing fine. My kids seem to be doing fine. My house seems to be in order. I'm self-control, check. Let's stop for a second and ponder the areas that we really have to consider in regards to self-control. Because when we start peeling back these layers of, again, not just external stuff, but internal stuff, that's where the conviction comes. That's where the conviction lies. So put letter A underneath point two on your outline like this, with your thoughts. We need to put on self-control with our thoughts. Turn with me to Philippians 4, 8. I think someone knew I was going there. <laughs> Philippians 4, 8. One that probably many of you have memorized at some point, which is great. And if you haven't, I strongly encourage you to do so. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. True, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. Those are the things that the Christian woman, the Christian in general, is called to set her mind on. And anything that does not fall into these categories needs to be sifted out quickly from our mind. I've described it before like this. Philippians 4, 8 acts like, should act, can act, memorize it, and it will be this for you, like a strainer of our minds. Not so much a filter, because here's the thing, ladies, we're still encased in flesh, right? The bad thoughts are going to pop into our head. But it's what we do with those thoughts when they come into our head that matters. So think of Philippians 4, 8 like a strainer. When I get this bad thought into my head, if it does not fall under this grid of true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, praiseworthy, I'm going to strain it out of my mind. Like when I'm dumping those delicious pasta noodles into my sink in the strainer, the water and the useless stuff that I don't need goes out. But what's the good stuff, right? That pasta, those carbs, is what's left, right? That's what Philippians 4, 8 needs to be for us. And so when these things pops into our minds, let's start, let's just start naming some of the things, whatever is true. That means that when I start thinking, what if, or when I start walking down roads that I don't know what the real issue, what the real outcome is going to be, when I'm imposing thoughts or opinions on someone that I don't know are true about them, when I am just believing things that aren't true to begin with, whatever it may be, whatever is true, I'm going to stop. And if I don't know 100% this is truth, I'm not going to let myself spiral down into the rabbit hole of what ifs. I'm not going to let myself spiral down into the rabbit hole of worrying about my future or of projecting um, motives onto someone that I don't know are there. I'm going to stop and I'm going to strain that out of my mind. And I'm going to keep what's good left. What's next? Whatever is 
honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, impure thoughts, things that God would not be pleased with, things that if the Lord came back in this moment and popped open my brain, I would be ashamed and embarrassed that that thought was running through my head if the Lord were to come back right now. These are the things that should get filtered out, should get strained out of my head. And the problem is, like I said, because we're in sinful flesh, so we're going to get those thoughts in our head. They're going to pop in. But what do we do with them? How do we stop ourselves from spiraling out of control? We have the self-control to get the strainer out and to dump all our thoughts through the strainer of Philippians 4, 8. Letter B, under put on self-control. We need to put on self-control with our feelings. With our feelings. And you may go, whoa, 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 hold up. With my feelings? I'm allowed to feel however I feel. I'm allowed to feel, you know, this is my truth. This is who I am. Don't stifle me. How dare you stifle me, Erica? Well, here's the thing. God's word actually has quite a bit to say about having self-control over the way that we feel. And I'm going to prove this to you. Turn with me to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. We need to be ready to not give ourselves a pass at feeling bitter, angry, having a lack of joy, having unrighteous jealousy, having a stubborn heart. Maybe it's a stubbornness to obey. Maybe it's a stubbornness and unwillingness to forgive. Maybe it's a stubbornness to not submit to your husband or to submit to anyone that's in authority over you, your boss, Pastor Elliot, whoever it may be. So often we just want to give ourselves a pass because it's just the way I feel. It's my feelings. We have to have self-control over our feelings and do what the psalmist does in Psalm 42, 5, which is, he says this, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He doesn't give himself a pass for being down in the dumps. He doesn't give himself a pass for feeling bad for himself. Maybe he's struggling even with bitterness or anger or whatever it may be. Whatever it is that's causing him to feel down. He says, no, 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 O soul. Why are you feeling that way? Hope in God. Further down in that same chapter, Psalm 42, 11, he says again, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him my salvation, and my God. Do you see what he's doing here, ladies? He's biblically counseling himself. He's biblically counseling himself through his emotions to do what the hymn says, turn his eyes upon Jesus and have his feelings follow. This isn't, I need to feel better and then I can obey, or I need to feel better and then I can praise Jesus. No, he biblically counsels himself to do the action first and then let the feelings follow. We need to have self-control over our feelings, over our emotions. And ladies, as women, that's a hard, hard thing to do. But we can't give ourselves a pass for sin. And we need to do what the psalmist does and biblically counsel ourselves out of the dumps, out of anger out of bitterness, out of stubbornness, whatever it is. Turn with me to Psalm 105. Psalm 105, 1 through 5. I'm sorry, 103. I'm like, that's not right when I started reading it. Psalm 103, 1 through 5. Again, David, bless the Lord who? Bless the Lord Israel? Bless the Lord all you people? Bless the, er, bless the Lord, O oh, the world. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Ladies, there have been some hard and painful times this year. And I'm looking over the faces of so many of you, and I know the trials that you've faced this year. I know the difficulties that you've come up against. I know the hurt. I know the pain. I know the difficulty of what 2020 has brought. But look at what David says. Again, inspired by the Holy Spirit. These aren't David's thoughts. These are the God of the universe's thoughts on paper. And he instructs us to biblically counsel ourselves. Not to do this L-shaped amen, like, yes, God, preach to them. No, it's me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Look at these benefits here, ladies. He forgives all our iniquity. He forgives my iniquity. He heals all our diseases. Now, we don't want to have an over-realized eschatology, right? That's going to happen in the New Jerusalem when death and sorrow and sin will be no more. But that is a reality. His victory is secure. That is going to happen. He's redeemed. If you're a Christian, he's redeemed your life from the pit. And he's crowned you with his steadfast love and mercy. Beautiful, beautiful truths. But here's the thing. You can't get self-control of your feelings. You can't biblically counsel yourself if you don't know what the Bible has to say. If you don't know the Bible's counsel, if you're not in the word, if you're not memorizing it, if you're lackadaisical about attending church or small group or dwell richly, if you think that it's okay to skip on your daily devotions, we have to be women of the word. If we're going to be women that put on the veil and live like Christ's bride, we have to know his word. Otherwise, if we go to biblical, biblically counsel ourselves, we're going to go, the, I don't know. What does God's word have to say about this? If you get to that point, just come back to Psalm 103, one through five. Go through all of the Psalms for that matter, right? Beautiful truths about who God is and how we are to respond to him are in the Psalms. We have to know his word. We have to get self-control of our thoughts, of our feelings. Don't worry, guys, it only gets harder. Letter C, put on self-control with your words. Put on self-control with our words. Don't worry, that's not our sprinklers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, deck and cover. That would be a really eventful woman's event. <laughs> That'd be a very eventful women's workshop. All right. I'm going to read these off to you, ladies. I don't think we have time to turn to each one. So bear with me, but jot these down. We need to have self-control with our words. Proverbs 13:3 says this, Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Proverbs 17, 27, whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. James 1, 26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. These are some strong words from God. Now, I have the benefit of having all four of these verses listed right here in front of me. So I'm going to tell you guys the operative word of each one of these verses. Jot this down. Proverbs 13, 3, guards. Proverbs 15, 28, ponders. Proverbs 17, 27, restrains. And James 1, 26, 
bridles. Are we getting the sense of self-control that's required with what comes out of our mouths? It's super critical. It's super important. I only chose four. I only chose four of these verses to stop and to look at. But the scripture is full, full of verses that talk about how critically important it is to have self-control over what comes out of our mouth. Now, this isn't a, this, this isn't a teaching on words, so I'm not going to get into it. But ladies, you know what should and shouldn't be coming out of your mouth. You should not be sharing other people's information. You should not be sharing other people's sin. You should not be sharing things that maybe you're critical of. You should not be saying words to your kids, your husband, your boss, your closest confidant, whoever it may be, that tear them down. No. For the Christian woman, our words should be what is said in Ephesians. They should be full of grace and useful and profitable for every occasion. That our words may give grace to those who hear. What is the overall consensus of these verses from Proverbs and this one from James? If you're a Hamilton fan, you can take it from Aaron Burr. Talk less, right? Smile more. Thank you. Talk less is the overall theme of these verses. I didn't even mention Proverbs 10, 19, but you could jot that down. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. The more that we talk, the more that comes out of our mouth, the higher the likelihood is that we're going to sin. The longer that we're sitting there chatting or just catching up or filling in, or even sometimes we'll be so bold as to say, I'm just venting, I just need to vent. That should be alarm bells in our head. The longer that I'm talking, the higher the likelihood is that I've already sinned in what I've said or that I'm going to sin. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips, again, there's that self-control, restrains his lips is prudent. It's so hard to do. It, I don't, God has wired especially women in a way that we process through talking and we are so relationally wired that that's how we get to know each other right that's how we get to know each other's hearts that's how we get to know what's going on inside of one another that's how I get to share but we have to be really really careful to not let that slip into sinful words that come pouring out of our mouths letter d Put on self-control, letter D, with your actions. So finally now, I guess words also, but finally now we're getting down to that external behavior. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. What a helpful way to think through losing self-control or not having self-control in our actions. Just that phrase, gives full vent to his spirit. What are the situations that we find ourselves in where we're giving full vent to whatever emotions, feelings, thoughts are going on within us. And when we get to that point where we're feeling like we're giving full, I'm giving myself over, I'm, I'm, I'm giving up, I'm surrendering to all of this that's going on inside me and I'm just coming out with it. That could be in angry tones to our kids. It could be in disrespectful things said to our husband. It could be in just straight up lack, lack of self-control over like our body. Slamming cupboards, slamming doors, whatever it may be. What is it that we're doing that gives full vent to our spirit? That's what we have to stop and look at and realize, okay, I may be 
this put together Christian woman, but behind closed doors, when is it that I'm giving full vent to my spirit? Those are the moments that I am lacking self-control. Hopefully though, you stop before you get to that point because we've given you two filters already to get through before you get to that point, right? Get self-control of your thoughts, get self-control of your feelings, and if you can do those first two things, then hopefully it never results in the full-blown, I'm giving myself over to how I think, how I feel, and just letting go. Just getting it all out. We can't give ourselves passes. It's not becoming of women who have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. All right. So not only does Paul instruct them to have self-control, which self-control really has this element of restraining bad behavior, right? That's what self-control is, holding back. But now there's the flip side of that that we get to in verse 10. Go ahead and put it down on your outline like this. We need to now put on good works. So what are the things that we're putting off? We just talked about. Now what are the things that we are putting on? What is the positive things that we are doing? Put on good works. So he has just said, don't do these things. You need to have modesty. You need to have self-control. Don't worry about braiding your hair and your gold and your pearls and your costly attire, but here's what you should adorn yourself with. But with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. What is proper for women who profess godliness. Paul uses that phrase often in in his letters. Not that phrase, but that idea of walking as children of the light, as walking of, as people who have been redeemed. Let's look at um, Colossians 1, 9 through 10. I just passed it. Colossians 1, 9 through 10. Again, this is Paul. And he says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to... Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There's this idea of living as who you are, living as a daughter of the king, living as the bride of Christ. Now, I think you guys are all good Bible scholars here, but I don't think it hurts to say Is Paul promoting legalism? Okay, that wasn't emphatic enough. Is Paul promoting legalism? (laughs) No, he's not. Is Paul saying that works, good works, are what get us into the kingdom? No, no. Thank you, Andrea. No. (laughs) Look at the equation here. They profess godliness. They're saying that God has called them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. In Colossians, he says, you're walking in a manner worthy to what you've already been called to. You're not walking in a manner in order to be called. You've been called and now you're walking in a manner worthy of what you've been called to. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. I know so many of us could probably say this by heart. One of my personal most favorite passages in all of scripture because it starts with the two, again, what I think are some of the most beautiful words in all of scripture. Ephesians 2, 4, but God. We have to back up. We have to start at verse 1 because you don't get the how good but God is unless you start in verse 1. So we're starting in verse 1. Ephesians 2, 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead. Can a dead person do anything? No. Can a can a corpse do anything, let alone anything good? No, they're dead. They can't. They don't have a heartbeat. They don't have blood coursing through their veins. They're dead. This is the state that you and I were both in until but God happens. And you, I 
was dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That is a hopeless, desperate, pathetic state that we have all been in. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. This is not your own works. This is your good works, Isaiah says, are as filthy rags. Do you know what that filthy rags meant? Literally, menstrual rags, period rags. Your good works are nothing as a dead trespasser in your sin. But God, this is not your own doing, picking up in verse 8. Nothing you can do. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Why? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's why Christ has saved us. He saved us so that we can put on the bride's veil of good works and go and live as children of light and be the salt, be the preserving, tasteful entity in this fallen and broken world. Turn with me to Luke 6. We're going to see how Jesus describes it in Luke 6, 43 through 45. Luke 6, 43. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. So let's think back in terms of Ephesians 4. A corpse cannot do good works. And a person that has been made alive cannot lay there like a corpse. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. How we conduct ourselves, including how we speak, is a reflection of what has gone on inside of us. And as Ezekiel 36 tells us, that when we are saved, God removes our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. And not only does he do that, but he gives us his spirit. And his spirit is now alive and at work in each one of us. We don't have to be slaves to death and sin anymore. We've been set free from that bondage. But we've been set free from that bondage, not to just wander around aimlessly, but to actually be doers of the word, like I said. To do what he has called us to do, to behave in ways that he has called us to behave. You don't have to, write, uh, you don't have to turn there, but write this down, Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, I implore you, again, this is Paul, I beg you, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. All of us, every part of us, from our thoughts, our feelings, our words, our actions, should reflect that we are the bride of Christ. 
I was reading a while ago um, about the Renaissance. I don't know. Um, I was reading a while ago and I came across this passage that was describing the Knights Templar. And the Knights Templar, when they were baptized, they would walk into the water in their full night year and they would hold their sword above their head and they'd be dunked into the water with their sword up above their head, their sword never going into the water. And that was the knight's way of saying, Christ, you can have all of me, but you can't have my sword. My sword, I'm going to do with what I please. I'm going to behave however I want to behave with my sword. So you can have the rest of me, but you can't have my sword. Sisters, I've had to ponder this all week long, and now I ask you to ponder the same thing. What is your sword? What is the thing that you are holding up out of the water saying, God, you can have the rest of me, but you can't have this? Is it your love? Your willingness to love the people that you're surrounded with? Is it sacrifice? Is it service? Are you willing to step up, like Pastor Elliot said, and be an owner in this church? Is it forgiveness? Are you withholding forgiveness from someone? What is your sword? Because I think if we're really honest with ourselves and we really dig deep and ask God like the Psalm, like David did in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my thoughts and point out any grievous way that you find in me. There's going to be something that we're saying, you can't have this. And it must not be so among us. He deserves everything. As Romans 12 says, our, our bodies are a living sacrifice. We could spend a whole nother hour and a half diving into all the good works that the Bible lists for us to do. Even if you just stop and think in terms of of your life sphere and the good works that you could do in each and everything. First of all, it's going to be so different for each one of us. Second of all, that would be a whole nother time of teaching to talk through all the good works that we could possibly do. So what's important is for you to spend time with the Lord saying, God, what do you have for me today? What do you have for me tomorrow? What do you have for me in this next hour? What is the next thing that you require of me? What is that good work? Is it that sacrificial, extravagant kind of love that we talked about at women's retreat? Is it a willingness to step up and take ownership and serve somewhere? Is it a willingness to forgive, a lack of a willingness to forgive your husband? What is that thing? And what is it that you require of me? And it's not just one thing, it's everything because we're a living sacrifice, right? It's all, all of who we are. We have to be women that are all in. We can't hold back from this Savior who showed his love for us while we were still sinners. Let's just even stop for a second and think about that reality. While we were still sinners... While you and I were actively the enemy of God, while you and I were actively running in opposition to him, while you and I were trampling over the blood of Jesus to get to our sin, while we were still sinners, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. But God shone his light on you and I at whatever time that was that he opened our eyes and revealed himself to us, whatever our Damascus moment was that he showed himself to us and revealed to us that we are a sinner in need of a savior. This God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were his enemies, he sent his only son to live the life that you and I can't live and die the death that you and I deserve to die. And he did that by stretching himself out on a tree and being pierced in his hands and his feet and being nailed to a cross. And not just that, but then suffering for this, the hours that he did. 
suffering and dying, experiencing the wrath of God that you and I deserve. This is the Savior that comes to us and bids us to put on modesty and humility, to put on self-control, to put on good works. This is the only reasonable response to this kind of extravagant love. This life of putting on the veil and looking like his bride, not just in word, but in the way that we conduct ourselves. It's the only reasonable response to this great kind of love. So let's do that tonight. Let's make a commitment tonight to put on the wedding veil, so to speak, to put on these things that we've talked about tonight and now go out and live in a distracted and disruptive world the way that God would have us live as his bride. You should have had um, some lyrics passed out to you because I thought it would be a great way to close out this teaching time by singing together, Take My Life. And so I'm gonna have Rebecca come up here and she's going to lead us just a cappella. We're like straight up house churching it at this point. <laughs> um, and she's going to lead us in Take My Life. <laughs> 